Thank you for joining us today. This is the second day of our webinars on disaster preparedness. Um, thank you for those who are returning from yesterday and welcome those that are coming uh, for the first time. Luckily, most of you know who NCPTT is, uh, having gone to our website and found out about these webinars. Um, Sarah Jackson gave a good introduction yesterday, if you didn't catch it. Uh, you can go back and view that. Um, for those who didn't, I'll sort of go over very briefly a little bit about NCPTT. Uh, my name is Jason Church, I'm a materials conservator, and today we're going to talk about disaster preparedness and response for historic cemeteries. Uh, now, historic cemeteries is an important uh, phrase in there. I'm not going to talk much about active cemeteries or ones, and we're not going to talk about uh, burial or burial loss or reburying after uh, floods, that sort of thing. Uh, we'll go over it briefly, but mostly we'll look at uh, issues in historic cemeteries. So welcome again. Uh, we're coming today from Lee H. Nelson Hall, uh, from the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training, usually abbreviated NCPTT. And here we are a research and training office of the National Park Service. Now for years I've said people, we're not your average park service. We look at cultural materials and we don't look at bald eagles and fuzzy bears. And I've said that for years, I've decided to change that thought because in fact we do look at eagles and bears, but just in a different way. So what we do here at NCPTT is look at cultural materials, uh, how they decay, what we can do to, st to stop that or slow that decay, what we can do to conserve these. Uh, we look at a lot of uh, ar architectural pieces, outdoor sculpture, things like that, uh, I do personally. And that's what we'll be talking about more today. So NCPTD's mission is to advance the application of science and technology to the field of historic preservation. In doing that, we have four main divisions here at NCPTD. We have architecture and engineering, archaeology and collections, materials conservation, and historic landscapes. So we'll move on and talk a little bit now about disaster preparedness for historic cemeteries. So the first thing we want to talk about is before the storm. This is really important. This is, in my opinion, the most important, to have this stuff ready before you actually need it. It's a lot better to be uh, proactive than it is reactive. We can get a lot more done being proactive. We can get a lot of things um, accomplished that we might not have thought about. So first we're going to talk about what to do before the storm, and we will get to what to do after the storm said before, you want to be proactive. We want to expect the worst. And we're going to talk about a little bit about documentation, emergency plan for the office and the staff, uh, staff training, and also contacts that you need to make, again, before the storm. That's not something we think much about, but we're going to go over that a little bit. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about is documentation. And why is this important? You know, what, what, do we, what do we mean by documentation in our historic cemetery? The first thing that we want is an account of the current condition. What do you have? What is the state that it's in? And this can be something as elaborate as a full inventory. Uh, I teach a lot of classes on documentation, and there's links on the NCPTD webinar, uh, website to webinars we've done on documentation and more information about that. But there's a lot of things that we can gain from having an account of the current condition. For example, we're going to talk a lot about disasters and people think about natural disasters, but I'm also going to talk more about man-made disasters. I uh, just read an article this week, I believe it came out of the state of Ohio, where they uh, caught a young man uh, who had a very large collection, I think 80-some pieces of funerary objects in his driveway. Uh, he was arrested, urns, uh, angels, vases, uh, you know, benches, all these things. And I noticed in the article, uh, the cemeteries in the area we're talking about sort of scrambling to see what they might have lost, looking around to see what they find missing. And a lot of that's going to be institutional memory because they don't have any documentation of what they currently have. Another thing in documentation we want to look at is the record of existing issues. Uh, if you have what we call a widowmaker, which is uh, large sections of trees that have rotten or been hit by lightning or windstorm and have fallen out but are still sort of hanging in the balance. Uh, you'll see large sections of limbs or trees sort of still hanging up in the canopy. If you know you have these, these are the sort of things that, you know, after a big windstorm, 
you need to go back out and check again, sort of, you know, problem areas that you find uh, when you record existing issues. Maybe in doing documentation and recording existing issues, you, you might make note of things like, oh, we know this area over here is prone to flooding. That's something we need to look at more often. Uh, we need to check back with after, you know, flooding or after a heavy rainstorm. Another thing that it helps us do is it helps us to establish preservation and stabilization priorities. For example, if you look at this photograph, we have a lower and an upper. In the lower photograph, we have, unfortunately, uh, this really nice Victoria mausoleum that has already just significantly deteriorated. All of our crenellation, all of our cut stones laying on the ground, it's probably not going to go much further right now than it already is. Uh, we've already lost a lot of the pieces that are going to come off. This definitely should be a priority. We need to bring in a preservation crew. We need to point that, that roof line before we start having issues. But we don't have active movement. This is something that's sort of in a stabilized state of decay. Whereas the upper photograph that we had, this is a very active issue. This is something we have these large slate panels. They're, they're sliding. They're moving away. In that, we have, um, we have a lot of water coming in. Our, our roof is now compromised. We, we can see the cemetery this is in is, is doing a good job. They're being proactive. They're trying to stabilize this. They've got the caution tape up. They're warning people that this, this mausoleum is actively moving. They've got their blue tarp trying to keep water out. But one of the big issues that we need to think about is if you have something like this, if you have a heavy windstorm, you have really heavy rains, tornado, hurricane, this is something you need to go back out and check. This is something that needs to be on the priority list that, you know, hey, we need to go find out, is that tarp still in place? Did our mausoleum fill up with water? If it did, you know, can we relieve some of that pressure, uh, internal pressure by maybe opening the door, that sort of thing? Because if you look back at the photograph, we have, um, you know, an active shifting facade. You know, we have four by four sort of supporting that. Um, so this is something that needs to be checked on, and we would know through documentation that this is a preservation and stabilization priority. So records management protection. <clears throat> there is a, a wide range of cemeteries out there, cemetery issues, and what you might have varies very differently from what the next person might have. Uh, some cemeteries, there probably is no records house. There's probably no records at all. Maybe the local library has a few things. Uh, but for the most part, records aren't part of your, your daily worries. Some cemeteries have very active records, active burials, maybe you know, 100, 200 years worth of burial records, maintenance reports, sales records, uh, lots of paperwork involved. What do we do about this? Um, there's a really wide gambit. We can do anything from you know, digitizing our whole collection to scanning it to just trying to protect what we already have. Uh, and I've seen most every issue in this uh, dealt with. If you have the money, digitizing your records is great. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about digital records in a second. Um, most sites don't have that in their budget. That's not a priority for them financially. You know, they're trying to keep the gates open. They're trying to keep the, the place maintained. Uh, issues like we saw in the last slide uh, dealt with. So digitizing the records probably, you know, might not be in the budget. So one thing I've seen is um, fireproof uh, and waterproof uh, storage cabinets, uh, large file cabinets that are, are fire rated, uh, things like that. These are things you need to think about. Uh, for example, uh, one cemetery I've, I've worked with, uh, they had in their protocol for disaster, if they, they were in a hurricane prone area, if they knew it was hurricane season, there was an intimate hurricane coming, what they would do is pack up all of their records, uh, seal the file cabinets, then the file cabinets got transported to a trailer that was already stored on site and ready. This went to a vehicle. The vehicle then took it to another city six or eight hours inland who already knew about this. The plan was already worked out, and it goes into an internal storage facility once it gets to that municipal um, government office eight hours inland. So they had sort of thought about this. They were very proactive. Hey, a hurricane's coming. Certain employees knew, OK, this is my job. They've called me into action. I'm going to go up, get the file cabinets, load the trailer, and drive 
uh, to a protected site. So there's all kinds of things we can do to uh, protect paper records. If you're in an area that's prone to, to flooding, uh, prone to hurricanes, uh, tornadoes, that sort of thing. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of notice for tornadoes, uh, but definitely for hurricanes. Another thing that we can think about, we talked about digitizing your records. This is really great. A lot of people are doing this. A lot of people putting their records online, things like that. But one thing we have to think about is it's very important to also back up these records for lots of reasons. Uh, one, just as records deteriorate digitally, uh, it's really important to have backups and copies, but also for disasters. If you have you know, a, a tornado come through, a flood come through, I've talked to lots of groups who have said, oh no, that's great, we digitized everything. and We have them backed up on a server and backed up on this hard drive and you go in and this is what's left of the records house. You know, this is what the offices look like. And you say to them, okay, that's great, you backed up on a hard drive, where's that hard drive? And they say, uh, we don't know, we don't even know where the office is at anymore. Um, when uh, here at NCPD, we did a lot of work with Katrina. We talked to groups, uh, talked to one cemetery, had all their records digitized. They had a backup copy on site. And then the cemetery's caretaker also had a backup copy at his house. Unfortunately, his house was only about five miles away. Both were gone. So that's one thing you need to think about. You know, a locally backed up copy may not be as useful as you might have thought. Uh, for example, here we're in a hurricane tornado prone area. Uh, all of our files, uh, all of our servers are backed up to California. So there's a lot of services out there on the internet you can find and things like that where you can back up records uh, off site in an area uh, farther away from you. So that's something you may want to consider uh, for your records management. Also, one thing that we look at is what's there are lots of plans out here. D plan is a really great one. Um, Dr. Striegel talked about D-Plan earlier. If you didn't catch that, go back and, and watch that webinar. Uh, D-Plan is an online disaster planning tool for cultural and civic institutions. And this is a free service you can go on. It's really comprehensive. Uh, it'll have, you know, you can go through and, and ask, and it'll ask you all kinds of things, like, you know, who gets called first? Where's the water cutoff located? Where's the gas cutoff located? What do you do with your records? And not only does this give you a good organizational chart, it also makes you think about a lot of things that you might not have thought about before in your office space or on, in, at your institutional space. So I, I recommend uh, going to dplan.org and checking that out and sort of learning from that. Another thing that we can talk about is staff training. All right, so we're going to come up with all these things. We're going to think about our records. We're going to think about pre-storm checklists and all that. Those things only work well if everyone knows about it and everyone's ready for it. So definite staff training, in-house training needs to be a high priority when we're talking about uh, preparing for a disaster response. And these are things we want to do well in advance before the disaster hits, before it's season for the disaster, before you ever have any problems. You want to know that your staff is going to know what to do when it happens. And we'll talk more about specific disasters and things like that. But one of the things that we also talked about is pre-storm checklists. So if, you, for example, here, you know, we talk about hurricane season a lot, tornado season. It's have, knowing what needs to be done when it's that time of year. Um, if you're in an area of the mountains and you have you know, mudslides in a rainy season or when it's the thaw season after winter, these are things that you want to know that you have. So, do you have tools available? What tools are going to be needed? Maybe it's chainsaws for clearing out uh, tree fall. Maybe it's chainsaws for clearing the roadways to get into the cemetery originally to start doing some more of the, of the work. Do you have those supplies on hand? Um, are your chainsaws ready to go? Do you have gas for them? Do you have oil for them? I know from personal experience, uh, about two weeks before Katrina hit, and about six months after, in the state of Louisiana, you couldn't buy a gas can, period. Uh, you couldn't get them in Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas. They just didn't exist. So it's making sure you have those things on hand and ready. Are they gassed up? You know, has maintenance protocol been followed? Is everything ready to go? And not only that, does everyone there have the training for it? 
Um, do you have people that have the proper training to use that chainsaw? Or did you assign uh, one of your employees to come in and cut who's never ran a chainsaw, who hasn't had the proper uh, training on it? So all these are things that need to be thought about uh, before the actual need for them. Um, another thing as far as our, our checklist is cemetery infrastructure. This is really important. This is something that a lot of people don't think about that sort of gets overlooked. But in cemetery infrastructure, we want to know that you know how to turn the water mains off. You know, what if you have trees that come out and they rip the water mains with it? Who knows how to turn those off? Is there a map available? Is everyone on site trained for that? Um, maybe you have gas lines that run into your cemetery. I've been to several cemeteries have you know, really beautiful uh, lamps lit at night, things like that. If you have trees that come down, they pull the gas lines off. Does anyone know how to turn those off? Do they know where the main uh, turn off to those? If we look back at our photograph, what we have here is um, a storm drain. This storm drain, believe it or not, um, is a full functional one. There's about six inches of debris built up in front of it. This is not what we would want to see in the event of a disaster. If it's the time of year that you get heavy rains, that you get hurricanes, someone needs to go around and check these. That needs to be one of the checklists, that someone goes around and physically inspects all the storm drains. It's amazing how much, you know, a couple pieces of wood that, are, that have fallen, you know, a good buildup of debris is going to, you know, greatly minimize the usefulness of this storm drain. Uh, I know, for example, I was uh, with the city of Savannah and uh, Department of Cemeteries. Uh, they do a great job of this. Uh, everyone has a very specific checklist. About a month before hurricane season, everyone gets issued their checklist. And you know, okay, I'm going to go and initial this map, all of these storm drains. That's my job. Someone else has storm drains in the next few blocks. And then everyone initials, they inspect all of them, not only in the cemeteries, um, not only the culverts in the cemeteries and the storm drains, but actually the entire city wide. Uh, they look at before hurricane and before the rainy season starts. And then we can take note, and we can go and make those a priority to fix those. So not only storm drains, but also culverts, you know, water cutoffs, gas cutoffs, uh, all important infrastructure issues. Is there a main power to the cemetery? Uh, do you have light posts down? Do you know how to turn the power off if they're damaged? That sort of thing. And also run drills, simulations. Um, maybe once a year, issue everyone these checklists. Make sure you know how to do it. Run a drill where everyone has to go in. Uh, I can remember working at a cemetery. We ran a drill where one of my responsibilities was to put the boards made for the caretaker's house over the windows before hurricane season. In doing that drill, we realized when the boards were made, they weren't labeled. And only one board fit each window. So that took us hours to figure that out. Luckily, it was a nice, beautiful day. We didn't actually have a, an emergency. We were able to figure out which window coverings went uh, bolted on each window. I can't imagine being up on a scissor lift in 20 mile an hour winds at the beginning of a storm trying to do this. Um, so drills are a very important thing that you want to run uh, maybe once a year, uh, have some fun with it. Um, I personally am a member of a group called uh, AIC CERT, the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works. It's their uh, cultural emergency response team. They run drills where we go through and we pretend, well, what would have happened if this area was flooded? What would we do if this area had gas leaks? things like that. So lots of great drills where you can, you can use to train your staff on what to do before it's actually needed. Another thing that I want to mention is, you know, why wait? Contact these groups now. Uh, you can register online for disasterassistance.gov. You can pre-register. Um, FEMA actually has a great pre-disaster mitigation website. They actually have grants available, uh, all kinds of online aids to look at you know, most people, we don't think about FEMA until it's happened and we're wanting money to clean up. Uh, there's a lot of great things that FEMA has pre-disaster. Another thing, important thing is maybe you don't have an internal staff. Maybe it's you. 
Uh, maybe you've got a, a garden club that oversees the cemetery. Maybe it's uh, part of a civic organization that you've taken over the care of the cemetery. You may want to think about calling a landscape disaster cleanup company. Um, you know, if a hurricane's hit, a tornado's hit, a, a fire's hit, everyone is calling that disaster company. That's the time that their phone's just ringing off the hook. You want to call them before the storm, talk to them, work a relationship up with them, have them come out, check out what kind of trees you have, what kind of canopy you have, talk with them about what is your most important issues. You know, if we have a big storm that comes through, we have trees down, we first want you to clear out the roadway so we can get in and inspect the, the stones, inspect the mausoleums, that sort of thing. You know, build up a working relationship with these groups before you're needed. And also the last on the list is a group called DMORT. Now this is uh, somebody we don't think about much, they don't get a lot of credit, uh, but DMORT is actually the emergency um, morgue, the emergency morticians that get called out as part of FEMA. So if you have a, a large disaster, uh, this is actually a mobile mortuary that comes and sets up, and these are mostly volunteers that are morticians from around the country that come in to help with disasters. This is a really important group if you have a historic cemetery, and most importantly, if you have an active cemetery. Find out who your DMORT people are in the area, get to know them, talk to them, say, hey, you know, I'm worried if we have a, a, a disaster, uh, we're going to need you guys. Um, that's who comes in and puts the bodies back, uh, puts loose and, and missing coffins, relocates those for you, that sort of thing. So a very important group, doesn't get a lot of, of notoriety, but uh, do an incredible, uh, incredible job. All right, so we've talked about before the storm. We've talked about what do we do to get ready for it. So now we're going to mention what do we do after. So disaster has struck. We've had our disaster. Uh, what do we do about it? What have we already planned? What didn't we plan for? Um, and, and what are we going to do? So when we talk about disasters, we could have floods. We have winds, you know, tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, ice damage. Uh, I know here in Louisiana we sort of forget about uh, our colleagues up north and the incredible amount of damage that ice storms can do, uh, especially in cemeteries. You've got water pooled up places, uh, a really bad ice storm. It's amazing how many obelisks and statues just slide right off. Uh, fire, and of course, man-made. Uh, we sort of think about disasters as Mother Nature uh, coming in on us. Uh, but definitely we want to talk a little bit about uh, man-made disasters. All right, so our disaster is struck. This is the time that we want to take a deep breath. The damage has been done. It's, it's done. We can't stop it. We can't slow it down. It's over. Now it's time to sort of take a breath, remember what we trained about, remember our checklist, uh, remember uh, our training, and, and start doing the things that we've, we've planned on. So the first thing we want to do is we want to identify hazards. Do we have power lines down? Do we have sinkholes? You know, as anyone knows that works in a cemetery, there's always holes in a cemetery. Do we have new holes that have opened up? Do we have um, unstable markers and trees? Mark these areas of uncertainty. We want to put our caution tape up. We want to put the cones around it because we don't want our volunteers coming in, uh, our landscape disaster crew coming in, and them finding that sinkhole that we already found earlier or then locating that, um, that vault that was collapsing that we already located. Uh, we want to make sure that we notify anyone coming in uh, of the issues that we might have found. So after the disaster, documentation again. Um, we developed a rapid cemetery assessment form. This is designed to sort of go in and figure out what happened, uh, sort of document some of the damage. Uh, you can find it on the URL seen there. You can also find our website by just putting in documentation or cemetery documentation, either one. Uh, there's lots of uh, tag words that'll, that'll take you to it. Um, this, is, this might be something that you're interested in having and, and filling out. There's also a definition and instruction sheet that goes with that. All right, so the biggest thing, the most important thing that we, we deal with is tree removal. That's our number one issue in historic cemetery. You know, the, the, the historic trees are what make our landscape unique. Uh, that's one of the things that adds character uh, and beauty to our cemeteries. We love the trees, but they also do a lot of the damage that we have. So tree removal, 
the people who are doing it? Do you have internal staff? Have they been trained? Do they have the equipment? Do they know what to do? You know, how to cut to keep from causing more damage, how to cut the larger pieces uh, so they don't fall onto uh, the stones that are already there. Uh, have you contracted with a landscape disaster company? In doing that, have you discussed the importance of your site? You know, this isn't someone's yard, this isn't you know, a park, this is a sculpture garden. You know, these are important works of art uh, all around us and, and need to be extremely careful and cared for. Uh, do they know that? Are they insured? Um, do they know how to cover the stones up uh, when they're cutting around them? Uh, there's some great uh, information on our website and through the Olmstead Center and through our landscape program about uh, tree removal and, and, and cutting and protecting the site. Also in that, do not discard any materials, any materials. Bag them, tag them, label them. Let the conservator decide that. Don't throw anything out, even if it looks like, oh, there's no anyone who can use this. It's all, you know, it's busted up. It's, you know, it's just tiny little pieces. Let the professional make that decision. Let the conservator decide what can be used and what can't. Uh, this is a great uh, example. Uh, this is some work done in Kentucky by uh, Monument Conservation Collaborative. Uh, they had a, a, an ice storm come through that area, took out a group of trees, and did immense damage to the cemetery. Uh, luckily, the cemetery had the foresight to keep every little part. And you can see here all the little pieces of parts they labeled, they put in storage. And when Monument Conservation Collaborative was ever able to come in and do the work, they had all these parts to work with um, in the conservation efforts to, to restore the site. So this is one of the important things to include in training, sort of mention to your staff, hey, you know, guys, if you're doing the tree cutting, don't throw anything out. Make sure we hang on to everything. All right, so pretty much now we've only talked about natural disasters. Also want to talk about man-made disasters. These can be trained for as well. These can be prepared for. If you're in an area that has a lot of graffiti, is prone to graffiti, it's something, even if you haven't had it yet, Unfortunately, you're probably going to have it. This is something you need to think about. Read up, talk to people, you know, what's working for them as far as graffiti removal. Um, I personally have gone out to different monument builders, talked to them, what's worked for them. But also, uh, a lot of monument builders have historic stone that they've replaced in cemeteries with newer granite. I've gotten historic stone from them. We've mocked up, and we've practiced cleaning graffiti uh, at sites I've worked in. We, we practice, we'll okay, we're going to pretend this area got tagged. What are we going to do about it? Um, what are these products going to help us? What products are good? What products aren't? And then, you know, do a little experiment, test around, see what works well for you. If you find what works well for you, have some on, on hand. Um, train train this, a couple people on how to do this. Um, if you don't have a staff, uh, maybe find a conservator in the area, talk to them, because in my opinion, if you get graffiti, if we have our man-made disaster here, we have, we've been tagged, this becomes really, really important uh, to deal with this as a top priority. And the reason is we know statistically um, graffiti encourages more graffiti, and we don't want that. We want to sort of uh, nip this in the bud, stop this uh, before it goes too far. Now, you might have graffiti, like in the first slide, where someone's just tagging their area. They're just telling everybody, you may have graffiti that is racially, uh, religiously hate motivated. Uh, this, in my opinion, um, warrants a little bit of a different hand. Uh, there's two rules of thought. Usually when this happens, the first thing people do is they call the local newspaper and they get them out and they say, oh my gosh, you know, we've been attacked. This is horrible and we need to tell everybody about it. And it is horrible. Um, it's the worst thing, um, you know, it invades our trust, um, it leaves us feeling vulnerable, uh, it leaves us as the cemetery and as conservators with an equal amount of hate. However, the person who did this wanted their message to be known. They had an agenda. They wanted people to know how they felt. In doing that, you've justified this person, you've validated their act of vandalism by 
calling in the newspaper for the newspaper to run an ad or the, the local news comes down, they talk about it, and now instead of a few people saw it, your entire county, your whole region, maybe nationally, knows what happened. Anyone sitting there watching that who has a similar message of hate is thinking, hey, that was a pretty good idea. Now if I do it, thousands of people are going to know about it too. And boy, my message will get out. So in my opinion, um, as a conservator, as a cemetery preservationist, um, my opinion is if you have this sort of vandalism, uh, keep it under wraps. Cover it up, tarp it, put up plywood, call in a conservator, bring in your trained staff, and remove this immediately, and just be done with it and have it gone. Um, I'm not a big fan of announcing it. Uh, I think it sort of validates uh, the vandalism. All right, so priorities. We come in on a site, we have this damage, what do we do about it? Um, our training kicks in, but we have to decide, we have to know beforehand also what's our priority. A lot of people I've talked to over the years, they come in, they say, all right, well, we need to stand the headstones up. That stone isn't going anywhere. It's down, it's staying down. We need to make the priority clearing the site so that we can inspect all the stones. We need to stabilize the ones that are damaged and maybe that includes laying them down. Uh, maybe we need to lay some down that are tilting or leaning that may fall on their own. Uh, it's going to do a lot less damage for you to gently lay it down than to have it fall and potentially chip, crack, break, uh, but also the human factor. Is it going to fall? Inevitably, it's going to fall when someone's there. Um, so we want to lay it down before we have to worry about uh, the safety issues. But to make that priority and figure out what has to be done first? Do we just need to clear the roadways so the trucks can come in and do the work? Uh, maybe there are no trucks coming. Uh, maybe we just need to clear the areas around the stones themselves um, to be able to do some work. Also for priorities, if we look at this, um, you know, whoever came to this did the right thing. Uh, it might be hard to see, but they, they put a, their yellow caution tape all the way around. They sort of blocked it off to, to warn people you know, we still have these large marble panels that are moving. You know, these aren't stabilized. These could fall at any moment. Uh, we want to keep people away from that. We want to come in. We want to photograph it, figure out what pieces we have, uh, start figuring out. Hopefully, we have some documentation of the where these panels go back um, and if these were full at one point or not. And then uh, start making that a priority, calling DMORT, talking to them, talking to your local uh, sheriff's department to say, hey, you know, we've got this mausoleum, it was damaged, um, you know, it, we had floods, went high winds, whatever, and we're missing some people, we know who they are, we know where they were buried. So for stabilization efforts, um, a lot of times when we have a large storm, maybe it's a tornado, maybe it's a hurricane, um, ice storm sometimes, a lot of times you'll have another one right behind it. So one of the priorities may be stabilization, just temporary emergency stabilization, such as this. We have uh, stacked uh, vault, burial vaults. Uh, the top's been blown off. We've got damage down the side. If we have another storm right behind, which is fairly common, this is going to fill up with water. That water pressure, uh, that weight pressure, is going to break this apart even further. It's going to push the other remaining sides out. So it's important, you see the gentlemen in these pictures, um, are coming in, they're tarping it, they're trying to keep more water out of it until um, conservation can be done, until preservation can be done on it. But the most important thing for them is just to stabilize it to begin with. Maybe you've got some low vaults that have been broken open. We want to keep water out. Uh, we also mentioned a little bit earlier about our mausoleum. Maybe you're coming out to your site and this is what you're finding. Uh, we have these grave depressions. They most likely had a coffin in them before our storm, before our flood, and we've lost these now. Uh, these have come out, they floated away. Um, that you've, you've got to call in help. You need to call FEMA or DMORT, uh, local sheriff's department, things like that. Identify, photograph, talk to them. Hopefully your records are intact and you can sort of say, okay, well we know who was buried in this area, uh, that we still have our records. And in that, I conclude uh, today's webinar on disaster preparedness for historic cemeteries. Uh, my contact information is included. Uh, feel free, if you're watching this recorded, uh, feel free to 
to email me if you have questions, uh, comments. Uh, if you guys, if anyone out there needs uh, advice or needs help, uh, doesn't mean necessarily that I would know the answer, but I'll do my best to find the person who does. Uh, email is always best, but I'm very, always very happy to help. Um, any comments, any questions, um, I'm very, very happy uh, to answer those. So thank you for your time, and hopefully you've gained some information in this that will help your site in the future. Thank you again.